Okay, so my presentation is about innovation uh, within the, uh, the network rail track bed team. Um, so the main aim of the track bed investigation team is to design uh, the track bed effectively and efficiently to ensure the desired level of service for, net for the network. So we, to, do, to do this we need to uh, think outside of the box. Um, I like that bit. So in terms of the process for innovation, we need to recognise the need in the first place. Um, think about developing a solution, uh, assess the engineering and financial benefits of the solution, looking at cost, risk and benefit, and then if need be, redesign and modify and improve as required. So we need to keep rethinking uh, as we go along to gradually improve uh, any innovative type developments. I'm sure a lot of people are aware that we've done various micropiling sites um, on the network. I think we've done about six, six of these now. So that's just a snapshot of um, some work on a, on a week's upgrade um, down at a place called Marlborough near Gloucester. So just three, three photographs that just show some of the, uh, the construction activity on that site. In terms of the design for that site, the, uh, the right hand cross section shows a typical um, cross section through a pile and the design and the depth in relation to the track. The right hand side just shows photographs of a, of a typical steel pile. The left hand plan is, is, is an extract from the design drawing that we did for Marlborough um, and it shows that we, we installed the piles actually between the, uh, the rail and, and the outside uh, of the sleeper and then we actually put four, four piles in some of the beds where we were piling over an 11 kV cable and we couldn't get to the required depth um, into the sort of stiff ground so we doubled up on the piling. Okay so moving on. Um, this, this just illustrates um, the dynamic loading from the, the track itself down through the pile um, into the base of the pile which is, which is on the, the competent uh, ground below um, and the diagrams are just showing the distribution of the, of the load through the various layers uh, and onto the actual piles themselves. Excuse me, the site at Marlborough, they, this, it had some um, remote monitors for the, for the maintenance people so they, they were installed at three metre intervals Throughout the site, there was a 30 mile an hour speed restriction on the site. Maintenance mo monitored it remotely and then came out where they, where they needed to, if any twist faults developed. So each of the coloured lines represent um, one of the sensors installed at three metres. The black, the black line represents rail temperature. Um, sensor D, D04 was one of the ones that was in an area of, of the, the highest level of settlement. We had something like um, 10 millimetres of settlement over, over 30 days. So that was the situation before piling with a, with a 30 mile an hour speed restriction on. Following the piling work, as you can see, there's a significant improvement in um, any sort of settlement. It's been significantly reduced um, and it, it's a few millimetres now over, over the 30 days. So the, the actual speed is, is now off on that site. Um, and we, we continue to monitor it as well uh, to see how, see how it's performing. So moving on to something else that we've developed uh, called sand grip. So we all know that formation problems occur uh, due to inadequate formation layer combined with, with poor drainage. Uh, this leads to slurry pumping and, and surface wet spots, reducing the performance and the life of the ballast. The picture on the right hand side is Birmingham New Street. That lasted six months before um, it started to pump and fail. It's actually got its own little blow holes in that, in that site as well because there's a significant amount of pumping um, going on. The um, bottom right hand corner again, I mean, similar to Steve's photograph, shows how the slurry is pumped into the drain there. The 40 to 50 percent of networkers experience formation problems doesn't relate wholly to the network but it, it's to do with a track stabilisation work bank that we've got where we've got a, a whole work bank of problem sites that have never been resolved by conventional renewals. So when we've analysed those it appears that about 40 percent will probably respond to some sort of formation type uh, repair and the other 60% should respond to some, some type of piling or soil mixing or some, some stabilisation method. So this just illustrates the pumping effect, so we've got the applied load through the sleeper and um, that transmits down through the ballast and the formation onto the subgrade. If the subgrade is susceptible to erosion then that fine grain material pumps back up into the ballast and, and then affects track quality and the performance of the ballast. Just a, a few illustrations of identifying um, subgrade erosion. So we've got HSTRC data, we've got um, ground probing radar, which is very good at, at spotting 
problems with subgrade erosion and then that's always backed up with um, targeted site investigation to confirm the conditions through the, the borehole logs in the longitudinal section at the bottom there. So what is a sand grip? So the purpose of sand grip is to reduce uh, particle migration and improve drainage properties of the track bed. Um, it consists of 250 to 300 mil of uh, layer of sand overlaid with a geotextile at formation uh, level within a, a sleeper bay and it extends out into the cess as well so we make sure that we create a, a drainage path. So effectively the diagrams on the right hand side sort of illustrate it. We, we do all the ballast in the, in the sleeper crib. We install a, a curved trench which is about 250 deep. We put sand into that overlay with the geotextile. So killing the subgrade erosion in that particular bay and, and, and when you actually take the ballast out it tends to extend a, a bit wider under the sleepers as well um, and also we think that we can install these in alternate bays and, and also drain um, the adjacent areas where there's, there's erosion taking place. So there's just three snapshots of um, pictures uh, of, of the first we just trialled it in a siding. So basically, we've we've vacuumed out the uh, the sleeper crib. Um, we've we've taken out the trench. Then we've installed the the sand blanket uh, to the, in the 250 mil uh, trench, and then we've overlaid geotextile and um, placed new ballast over the top. So I have a, a video of the rail vac um, actually installing um, sand grips on on a trial basis. And it gives the times of each activity as well as you go through. achieved installation of a sand grip in six to seven minutes. The guys, if they got into a routine of this, thought that they could probably improve on that as well. So it becomes quite an effective way. We could probably do 100 metres of um, formation treatment in a sort of eight hour shift. So typically we've got a subgrade pumping up into the ballast. We come along and install the sand grip with the sand and the new ballast and geotextile and then that takes away um, we're not sure whether it'll take away all of the subgrade erosion problems by doing it in alternate bays, but it will certainly reduce the pumping effect. And if we had a very severe subgrade erosion site, then we could actually um, install a sand grip in, a, in every sleeper trip as well. Under sleeper pads, I've, I've been endorsed by Professor Ed of Track. He is sort of sponsoring the, the pads to go forward, so we're looking at installing them, particularly in plain line, um, on a much bigger scale. Uh, in the UK than we have been doing. 
we did quite a lot of research on undersleeper pads to look at uh, what, what the European experience was. This showed improvements in track quality, uh, improved ballast life, less maintenance, increasing tamping intervals by a factor of two to three. They've installed them in some areas with reduced ballast depth and, and lower whole life cost. And the graph on the right hand side shows the, uh, the blue line there, or the darker blue line, where pads are installed and how it extends out the, uh, the maintenance intervention uh, between tamping intervals. So as well as taking a lot of the research and information that was out, uh, out in Europe, um, we undertook some um, modeling, finite element modeling ourselves to try and verify what some of the research and, and the experience was, was saying in Europe. That was pretty well backed up with, with the uh, finite element modeling as well. Um, the output of that was to, to produce this graph which shows the stress reduction depending on, on where the track quality sits um, and how much stress is reduced by installing an undersleeper pad. So it's somewhere between 5 and 15% reduction of stress within the ballast layer. Uh, exponentially that, that equates to 60% plus uh, increase in ballast life. Part of the business case for taking undersleeper pads forward is to convert um, this, this, this is, there is a cost saving to be made here, is to convert CAT 11 renewal site, so that's completely renewal reballast, to a CAT 16, which is a complete renewal rail sleepers under sleeper pad, but undertake a, a skim dig. Um, again, this is supported by, by a professional head of track, and we've got a robust process that we need to go through to, to confirm that a site is suitable for conversion from CAT 11 to 16. So that looks at the detailed death study, rates of deterioration, looking at ballast fouling and, and also track, physical track bed investigation to support that decision. So we did a study on um, the 15-16 work bank. Um, typically there's about 90 miles of um, CAT 11 renewal um, in, in that particular year. And applying the process I've just showed you, um, it suggested that about 36% of sites would convert um, from complete renewal reballast to complete renewal with undersleeper pad and skin dig. And then you get into a different cycle of renewals where you do ballast cleaning. So it has to be a ballast cleanable site as well, but you get into a, a different cycle where you, where you ballast clean in 10 years time and then there's a 20 year interval between the ballast cleaning. So over the life of the asset 50 years, there are some quite considerable savings and there's a short-term savings by uh, reducing the ballast element in CP5. The, the other more recent things that we're, we're trying to look at in terms of innovation is um, GPR data advanced analysis. So the aim of this is to try and get more out of the GPR data to help us understand the condition of the track. Some previous research has shown a strong correlation between ballast fouling index and the ability to drain hydraulic conductivity. So ballast hydraulic conductivity is defined as the measure of how fast a fluid can move through the, uh, the ballast pores. So there's some previous research undertaken in the States and that, that graph was produced which uh, represents fouling index along the, um, the horizontal versus uh, hydraulic conductivity. And then it, within that paper they defined as what, what is good, good draining ballast and it's something in the order of about 2.5 centimetres per, per second. Uh, and the graph's looking at foul ballast and also clay impregnated ballast. So, we're hoping that that data will help us um, with, with with other things as well. Um, so in terms of processing it, we take the uh, the two gigahertz ballast fouling index, we do some processing and data analysis to produce a hydraulic conductivity spectrogram or colour graph. So this next slide um, explains the process there. So we've got the the top um, colour graph is the, is the standard ballast fouling output that we get uh, through the GPR system. Um, so we want to then convert that into a, a hydraulic conductivity spectrogram um, doing some analysis. And we've, we've tried it just on one, one eighth there and, and anything where you see red is, is, is poor conductivity through the ballast and that was sort of backed up with the track quality rate of deterioration that you can see on, on the right hand side there. So this, this is early days and it's in development at the moment but we want to try and use that to maybe support a study that we're doing for, we've all tried to do this many times in terms of ballast returns and predictions and things, so we're trying to do a detailed study again for the high output team 
and we would use that, that data as well. So the aim, the aim of this study is to design an intelligent data-driven system that can predict site suitability for ballast cleaning and predict outputs. Accurate ballast return predicts will allow high output to improve uh, production planning capabilities, plan and predict machine output during possessions, maximise the potential. And also we'd like to, at the end of this study, um, train the machine operators so they're all consistent in the way that they switch on and switch off the total load because we're not quite sure how, how well that is controlled on site. So to allow us to do that, we've, we've just started on that. Um, so we're, we're taking all those data sets that you see there. We want to understand whether it, the weather may affect how, how good a site will ballast clean, all the other usual data sets, maybe look at some stiffness measurement information, um, and we want to feed that into a, a central system of artificial intelligence that can, can analyse this data and, uh, intelligently and give us some answers. And the answers that we want are on the right hand side there, so is the ballast cleanable, when is it cleanable, to what depth is it cleanable, and amount of return. And I think high output would even be happy with a low and high category for ballast return as, as a starting point. Um, so closing statements really rather than conclusions, <coughs> modelling techniques have allowed us to gain a better understanding of behaviour of track system. With smart, innovative, data-driven processing techniques we have utilised our existing data sources in a more efficient way. Combine these two together um, has provided us with the ability to design, maintain and construct track bed more effectively and efficiently. I'm just about on time.